Well, it, it says what, what the book it's for, right? Yes. So. Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. Well, according to that clock from the 6.30, okay. we, we're good? Okay. Welcome, everyone. I'm so happy that you're all here tonight. I'm Tara Ripley, and I'm the Adult Services Librarian at the Oregon Public Library. Um, so I'm really excited to have with us again tonight Kelly Maloney. Um, that's your pen name. Did you want yeah. me to say your real name? <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, I'll it let doesn't Kelly matter. <laughs> so that's why I it'll be easier to remember if we don't confuse. We'll just go, with, it's go with the author. Okay, our author. <laughs> um, we're really excited um, to have this really great presentation tonight, and we also look forward to um, her next author presentation, which I believe is in November. November third. Um, on her on her newer book. Um, Death of Me, which is the second in a mystery series, um, and looking forward to. So I think that's all of the <laughs> prattling on that I need to do. Um, I'll pass it over to our author. All Thank right. <laughs> okay. So hello, welcome. I'm Kelly Maloney. And I'm here today as part of a month-long Alzheimer's Awareness Month to highlight Alzheimer's Awareness Day tomorrow. First of all, let me tell you a little about myself. I am not a medical expert on Alzheimer's or dementia, but before, <laughs> before you get up and leave, I do know quite a bit a lot, a lot about Al Alzheimer's and dementia. Um, I learned this by just walking the walk and talking the talk. That said, I was aware that my mother was forgetting events and confusing dates, but I didn't find it concerning. After all, mom was hard of hearing in, in one ear and nearly deaf in the other. She often didn't wear her hearing aids at home to save the batteries. So she often, or, um, lost my place already. So. She often didn't hear what people were saying much of the time. And it showed on her face. She would nod or laugh like she knew what they were saying, but her expression looked like she was still trying to figure it out. Mom was still able to drive her car 300 plus miles to, you know, both ways to our house for holidays and birthdays. She would push a cassette tape in the tape player in her car and seeing the whole drive. She unwrapped some hard candy and put them in the cup holder to suck on during the drive. At that same time, her best friend had been, at a or had been diagnosed with cancer. That was in the fall, and by Christmas, her friend had passed away. She took it hard. She was depressed after that, but that was understandable. But then I found out she was sleeping long hours during the day. I suggested she talk to her doctor about depression, but of course, she wouldn't. She didn't want anyone to know. Then she began calling because she couldn't find recipes she had made all her life. She asked me to mail, email the recipe to her, only to find her email wasn't working right. Even when she followed a recipe, it never worked out. She often forgot to add ingredients or added it and forgot she added it and so added it again to be sure. Whatever she made never seemed to work out right. When I visited, I had asked her if she ever forgets to turn off the stove or oven and she said, never. A Couple minutes later, I heard the stove click as it heated up again to keep this hot the food is hot in the skillet. One day, my sister called to say she thinks mom had Alzheimer's. I assured her she didn't. She never heard things in the first place and was depressed over the loss of her best friend. When you love someone, you don't think the worst. You throw them a little slack and understanding. But my sister persisted about Alzheimer's. She then told me odd things mom did that I never heard about. I told her if she really thinks mom had Alzheimer's, she should call mom's doctor. It turned out she was diagnosed with vascular dementia a year earlier, 
Neither she or her doctor felt the kids needed to know. I have heard, I've heard it said that the parent becomes a child and the child becomes the parent. I naively dismissed that as a humorous metaphor, how I've grown since then. When my mother was diagnosed with vascular dementia, I read articles in books on the subject. I felt confident offering to help my mother through this difficult time of her life. After all, I was an at-home mom. I had three sons in five years' time. Surely three young boys, newborn to five years, was more of a challenge than my sweet 75-year-old mother. I knew what to expect. Confusion, forgetfulness, mood swings, and eventually, mom wouldn't know me anymore. It didn't faze me. I was ready and willing to be there helping mom through the difficult years ahead. I've known my mother 50 years or more by then. I knew her love of shopping, her gift of gab, her artistic talents, her, her fondness for flora and fauna, and her outrageous sense of humor. Then suddenly, she was a person I never met before. She became a person I sometimes didn't like very much at times. And yet, I never stopped loving her. Mom's dementia consumed her brain more rapidly than I ever thought possible. But I was devoted and promised her we would travel this downhill journey together and it would be all right. But reality has a way of choosing its own path. This was not a downhill journey at all. It proved to be an exhausting upward climb, steep and rocky and blocked by endless obstacles. The more mom's brain was consumed, the more difficult it became to navigate the path. There are no set rules, no easy fixes, no turning back or regaining what is lost. Mom's dementia took her in only four years time. In my experiences, Assisted living facilities assured me they knew how to handle dementia. A few months later, I learned they only claimed that to fill empty beds. And, by, and the way they handled dementia was to drug the patient with dangerous antipsychotic drugs that is not recommended for elderly patients with dementia or Alzheimer's, as it can lead to death. Staff actually went behind my back when I told them I didn't want her on those meds. So they contacted her doctor and told, us, told a story of mom being wild all day. Yet when I visited that same day, she was fine. Her doctor called me later to ask, what's going on with your mom? And she told me what they told her. She had put mom on the meds as requested but I told her I didn't want her on them. She then put mom on a safer med. Even mom's doctor was deceived by the staff. Imagine her care staff lied about mom's behavior, saying she was wild and tearing down decorations in the halls. I had to wonder how she managed it. I, um, she was 75 years old, pushed a walker, gripping it with both hands, and went pretty slow behind it. Apparently, the staff never checked on her since she had that much time to pull decorations down, if that was even true. That wasn't the only evidence of not knowing how to handle dementia. Staff had no clue. Mom often told outrageous stories. My belief is that she saw silly sitcoms and thought they were true, and later remembered as happening to her or people that she knew. When mom had a stroke and finished rehab for a month, she returned to her assisted living facility. She knew she, knew she had a stroke, so every day she told the staff, I had a stroke. And every day they would call an ambulance and send her to the ER. I would run out to ER <laughs> only to be lectured not to send her as she was just feeling the residual effects of the stroke. But she said it every day 
and they sent her every day, and every day I ran to the ER to hear their lecture. I, I talked to the staff about not sending her and why, but the rules were, if a resident says they had a stroke, they have to transport. I finally convinced them to call me and I'll assess mom's, if mom had a stroke or a new, you know, or, or was just the residual. Staff knew how to handle dementia, they claimed, yet they believed everything my mom said. One day, the care manager called because mom was crying and upset. The, um, the so-called expert on dementia wanted to know the details of her grandson's death. Excuse me? <laughs> I told her no one died in the family. She had the audacity to ask if I was sure because mom was upset and crying all morning. I assured her my three sons were fine and well, and if one of my sister's sons died, someone would surely have called me. She questioned that again, believing mom over me. My answer to her was that no one died. If they had, someone would have called me, not mom. I reminded her that mom has dementia and makes up stories. This facility actually kicked mom out because I trusted her doctor about the dangerous drug and did not want mom on it. When I talked to the administrator, he said the staff told him that they kicked mom out, but he assured me he didn't allow that to happen. No staff member ever, ever passed on that information. Of course I moved mom anyway not wanting mom in a place where she wouldn't, where she wasn't wanted and wasn't being cared for properly. Due to these problems with care, I decided to journal mom's journey to remember facts about my mother's health, happiness, and decline. My brother and sister live in faraway states and I would send emails to keep them up, on, up to date on mom. After all, though mom was at a care facility, other medical problems happen. Staff didn't follow the diabetic diet her doctor prescribed. One day her blood glucose was 520. I asked what they fed her that day. They gave her pie. Sundays were pie day and everyone gets pie. Even diabetics. Her doctor ordered, uh, sent an order saying no more pie. There were also bills to pay, many medical decisions to make on my own, falls, mom broke her nose from a fall and also a broke, broke a toe. Every day presented a new medical problem. Writing it down became therapy to me. It helped to get it all out of my head and behind me. But of course, I couldn't just forget all mom and I went through over those four years. In the end, I spent the last week of her life at her side, checking countless times to see if she was still breathing. When it was over, I felt relief that she would no longer lay motionless, silently dying on the inside day after day. Yet I grieved because she was gone from this earth, and her passing left an empty hollow in many hearts. People told me mom was better in a better place. She was better off. She used to be such a nice lady. Others dwelled on her dementia. What a shame. Your mom was no longer your mom. But I see mom's life in its entirety and not just the end. Dementia may have ended her life, but it didn't define her. It changed her personality for a while, but it wasn't who she was. She was my mother, who suffered from a serious disease at the very end of her long fruitful life. I saw it no different than if she had terminal cancer or a crippling condition. This disease took its effect on her no different than any other disease would have. Mom was not someone to be pitied. Because of it, 
She, wanted, she wasn't someone who caused me embarrassment or shame. She loved to dance and still boogied behind her walker. Granted, it was hard work helping mom through this disease. It felt like a thankless job much of the time. Decisions were difficult without feedback from the patient herself. Mom didn't know me anymore and often didn't appreciate my visits. But when I visited mom, I saw her as my mother, but she didn't act like my mother. She no longer knew me, but I knew her. It was my turn to return the favor of such great love. My advice to anyone taking on the care of a loved one with memory loss is, keep your sense of humor finely tuned. Laugh when you can, cry when you must, consult with your patients or your parents or loved one's doctor before changing meds. And most importantly, it's important not to judge, but to love. Before we go to questions, let me tell you a little more about me. I'm actually a mystery writer. My first novel, The Death of Stacy, was published in 2021. This summer, I introduced the Lauren Murphy mystery series inspired by the popularity of The, Beth of St the Death of Stacy. My second novel, The Death of Me, published this summer. And soon after, I began thinking about the journal I wrote about my mother's journey through dementia. I never intended to publish it. It was strictly therapy for me, but I had lent it to a friend whose mother was diagnosed with dementia and she found it helpful in knowing what to expect through my experiences. It occurred to me that maybe it would be helpful to others who are just beginning their journey with their parent or loved one. So I put it out there, and so far, it's my best seller. People that have read I Am My Mother's Mother <clears throat> have shared their own experiences after reading it. It helps to know you're not alone. Again, thank you for coming tonight. And I'll take questions now. And I also brought with me the, my two mysteries novels, in case any of you are mystery fans. <laughs> thank you. <clears throat> so if anyone has Questions or comments? <laughs> yeah? When choosing a caregiver, how can you determine the care that your loved one is going to get and if they do understand dementia and Alzheimer's? They may claim that. Mm -hmm. How can you get that clarified? And even to the, at this point, I it took me two different facilities and, and then finally the third one um, was the charm it was in a memory care center in Verona and um, they were wonderful and I could tell a big difference when I moved her there um, the first facility that she was at it was a semi-assisted um, uh, facility or apartment buildings, really. It was, apart it was senior apartments, but they had assistance for daily care. And um, my brother had my mom um, assessed or evaluated as far as, you know, the, he took her to a ne uh, um, neuropsychologist. And because she was early stage when, when we found out that she was diagnosed with dementia. And so we needed to know, we, we didn't have any warning because the doctor didn't tell us, my mom didn't tell us that she got that diagnosis. Um, there's probably HIPAA rules involved in, in that situation. But um, what was recommended by the neuropsychologist was she was doing well on her own as it was, you know, but she needed daily help with grooming and cooking and things like that. So we moved her to an apartment building that had assistance. 
um, there they did minimal assistance and which we didn't know I mean it cost as much as full assistance but you know you, we don't you don't know it's it's almost a trial and error kind of thing but we moved her um, I think it was after six months after we moved her to that building, she had a stroke, and then uh, and then she did a month of rehab, and when she came back from rehab, that was when they kept sending her to the emergency room. And so we ended up finally moving her closer to home, and um, they they again sh assured me we know how to do dementia. We know how to handle dementia, but they clearly didn't <laughs> because they're the ones that wanted to give her the antipsychotic drug and just when it, she was on and off it for a few times and every time she was on it she was just a zombie. So, um, you know, my doc, we, I have, was in close contact with her doctor and you know, assuring me that she should not be on that drug because, you know, they need to keep their brains active and they can't do that when they're sleeping all day. So we ended up moving her a second time and that's when we found a, that our doctor recommended our, um, a new memory care place that was opening up and they high, she highly recommended it. And that was when we really could tell the difference in care where, you know, the other staff would, they'd come up and talk real loud in her face because she's almost deaf, but they would yell at her and she thought they were, she was being yelled at and she, it upset her and she'd start shaking her hand and, you know, when she's nervous and upset and, and it just, they had a real hard time with her just because she didn't, she wasn't able to respond to them, you know. She she would get angry. She would call them names. <laughs> she would say words she did. I never knew she knew. <laughs> you know, she'd be cursing, and and it was just, you know, very difficult for her in you know to be in that situation. But when we moved her to a memory care, it it just made a world of difference. I mean, they, they would explain to her, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hold your elbow and help you up. You know, everything that they did, they explained to her first. And it didn't, they just didn't come and shout in her face and push her along. And, you know, they'd, my mom was in an elevator, you know, at, at one, of the, one of the other places that we were at, that she was at. And, um, she couldn't work the elevator because she didn't know how. And um, I went to ask, you know, where she was at lunchtime. And they told me, oh, she's done. She went up to her room. And I went up to her room and she wasn't there. And I said, well, I can't find her. <laughs> and they said, oh, sometimes she forgets to push the button. Well, she must have been in the elevator a long time because she was sitting on the floor crying because she, was trapped in the elevator. So it, it's those kind of situations that, you know, you don't want to get into. And, and, I, and honestly, I, I asked a lot of questions, but everyone assured me that, that they can do it, that they know how to handle t dementia. And, you know, it's just, it's really hard to know. <laughs> Did she go willingly <clears throat> to the facility? And if so, I mean, not. How did you get her there? <laughs> <laughs> um, the first time, well, the first one that we went to, the semi-assisted, it was a beautiful place. I mean, it had, a, uh, it was like a restaurant the, where they made the, did serve the meals. You know, they gave them a menu, they had a, it was, it was, they had a fireplace in there. It was a like a beautiful restaurant. And um, 
I took her and I also had my sister come and see it because I, you know, I wanted to have their input and, and let them see where she was going to be and everything. And um, she did okay. She had, she had friends. They matched her up with friends at the tables, you know, that were about the same stage of dementia. And she had a really good friend there. She made friends with a lady. Um, unfortunately, that lady had a heart attack and died while she was away at rehab. So <laughs> it's just a lot of problems, you know, that you run into that you don't expect to. But she, but <clears throat> she was willing to go? Like she, she was fine with that move? Well, she, <clears throat> with, with, with her dementia, she was, you know, she went to see it because we just took her there right. and and it was a really nice place it was beautiful you know she thought it was really nice um, but she was nervous you know she was stressed while we were touring it and um, my sister was there her son was with her, with her and um, we took her all around showed her the whole thing and when um, it came time for me to take her, you know, I had a driver from Green Bay down here. So when it came time to take her, and I had her stay at my house first, where she was comfortable and she knew, and then we went to see, and well, we, and we needed time to get the paperwork, sign all the paperwork and things for the, for getting her in there, you know, getting her put, um, you know, registered there. And so when, when we went to go there, she never remembered seeing it. She, it. she was too stressed. She never remembered even seeing it. And so when she did see it, you know, I, we took her up to the apartment and she said, so how many people do I have to share this with? <laughs> and I said, it's, your, it's all yours, no one, it's all yours. It was a two bedroom apartment, a little kitchenette, and um, very nice place, but she didn't remember ever seeing it before. So she was actually really relieved that, you know, she didn't have to share it. It was a really nice place. You know, she just kept saying, it's, this is mine, this is all mine. Yes, it's all yours. And so she adapted really well. Um, she did have trouble recognizing her furniture when the movers brought it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because at her house, she knew everything, you know, and she picked out what she wanted to bring. And but when um, they moved the furniture in, she didn't recognize it anymore. It, it wasn't in the same house that it was in before. So she didn't recognize it as her furniture. But otherwise, you know, she she kind she was pretty passive at that time, and you know, it, she wasn't adv more advanced. If it was more, if she was more advanced, I'm sure she would have put up a fuss. But in the last time, in the last move, you know, I she was just confused. It was a lot of confusion, and we just said, you know, don't worry, we'll take you, we'll take care of you, and you know, we got her over there anyway. But, yeah. <laughs> uh, so when she was first diagnosed with uh, dementia and she was aware of it, and the doctor was aware of it, did, do you know, did she go to the doctor specifically because she knew that she was losing her memory? No, I think he recognized that she was um, having difficulty. And so it, um, you know, I, we, I lived in here in Oregon and my mom was up in Green Bay. So, you know, we, we talked all the time on the phone, but you don't really, if you can't really see her and, and she might not be forthcoming with information, you know, we really didn't know, you know, that anything was really amiss because, you know, like I said, that when you're not hearing things in the first place, it's easy to be confused. It's easy to not know what's going on. But um, 
when when my sister called her doctor, then the doctor told her that she was already diagnosed with vascular dementia. But so we, you know, we really had to scramble because we just found out, you know, bam, we found out, and we had to find some place for her because she wasn't getting along as well as we thought she was. So we just had to really scramble and try to find find uh, some place for her. Yep. And uh, <coughs> about what age, in other words, is it, is it uh, all up to the individual? Um, okay, say they're 30 years old, 35 years old. Um, if they're starting to get violent, and they've never been violent, mm -hmm. Is that, is that a, a, a quick sign that this is coming on with their, this dementia stuff? And because they're not remembering everything. Yeah. And, but is that a sign of, uh, that the, it's coming on to them? And are they gonna be real violent? I well, like I say, I, I'm not an expert. I, I know about dementia and dealing with it. Um, I, you might be talking about something else, like maybe, um, um, oh, what's it called? Bi being bipolar, maybe? That if no, they get. Some, some, and I'm in the process of taking care of two people with uh -huh. dementia and Alzheimer's. Okay. So, and I just wanted to come to it. But they're, they're in the process. Some people get violent, is what he's asking. Okay. To see people. And yeah. They do, some can reverse and get real violent and argu argumentative. And well, I know my mother was never violent. And um, one of the facilities actually, when they were kicking her out, they actually told me that um, she had to go to because um, she, hit, uh, she hit one of the other residents. And, you know, and I couldn't believe it. I mean, not my mother. <laughs> and so, and, and I knew the guy. I mean, I, I visited there almost every day. So I knew other people that were residents there. And I knew the guy. And I told the social worker that, um, could I, that I was told that she hit this man and I would like to go and apologize to him, you know, can you, is that, would that be okay? And she says, oh, I don't know. And I said, well, I, I really feel bad, you know, that my mom hit him and I really feel she's not gonna be able to apologize for herself. So I really wanted to apologize for, to him. But as it turned out, when I talked to him, he, I told him, I'm, I'm sorry, I heard that you, my mom hit you and at the breakfast table or lunch table and I said I just feel really bad and I want to apologize for that and he said what your mother never hit me and he, are you sure <laughs> and he says no I mean yeah I'm sure she never hit me she's gotten in my bed because you know she doesn't know where she you know where her room is ever and he named off all these things wrong with my mother <laughs> which were true and um, but um, he said, no, your mom never hit me. It never happened. So, you know. Is there any, is there any um, medication that um, if they, something that's kind of mild and mellow that they could keep working these people through up until the older, older age to keep them from this, getting this, yeah, well, I'm not sure. I mean, I, I, I don't have um, experience with a younger person, you know, like 30, 35 years old. Um, I only know my mother was more elderly than at the time. And so, I mean, they, the uh, antipsychotic drug that they had her on for a while was um, Seroquel. And and I'm pretty sure that there was another lady that she had 
her lunch with at di the dinner table. And she was very sharp, very with it. Um, and then all of a sudden she just started deteriorating and coming in her bathrobe for lunch at odd hours, you know, and it wasn't even lunchtime. And, and she just looked like a zombie. And I was pretty sure that that was what that lady was on. And it was like just within three or four weeks, it seemed she passed away. So, you know, and I said, I definitely don't want my mom on that. So, but I, I don't know for a fact that that's what it was, but it's, I'm a suspicious because when I, my mom was on it, she was, she was just a zombie too. I mean, she just slept all the time. She didn't want to do anything. You know, she was just spaced out. And, that, and that's not what the doctor wanted for her, you know. I've got a sister in the nursing home, and um, and I see all these other people, and they're riding up the hallway in the in a uh, wheelchair. Yeah. And they got a doll, they got <laughs> a, uh, a puppy, or you know, with them, and and they just look at you like, who are you, or, you know? Mm -hmm. there's, yeah. there's nothing, there's, there's not a thing, they're, they're just long gone. Right? Yeah. Well, I think sometimes um, the facility kind of promotes that kind of thing, like where they give, they give a stuffed animal to snuggle and cuddle. Yeah, yeah, to keep them, you know, quiet and well, that would make sense. and occupied. You know, they can be occupied by by that. But <laughs> yes. <laughs> Well, I know we had, I, I took with us, we had a several page, like a 13 page analysis, you know, for, from the neuropsychologist. So, and it, and it pretty much spelled out, you know, where she was at and, and um, so, I, you know, I think we just took that as, as proof and she, I had a doctor already set up for when she came there so that she had a doctor, you know, because she was diabetic and so she, I wanted her to have a doctor right away. So, but I don't remember ever needing more proof than that. I mean. Oh, okay. Yes, she went to her primary and then she went and then they sent her to UW. And that was a process at UW. And she had to have two, but then his sister, just one doctor, and that's all they did. Yeah. So I think it might depend on the facility or something. Yeah, yeah. I do. I really think that's what it yeah. is. It depends on I think they just have their own set of rules or right. requirements. Yeah. Well, I, I do think my, my, the doctor that I had for my mom, um, she was really great. And, you know, she, when my mom came in for doctor's appointments, you know, she, she didn't want to be there. She'd shout at her, she'd shout at me and the doctor. And, you know, she, she'd get pretty angry and, you know, I'm going, get me out of here. <laughs> I'm leaving, I'm going, get me out of here. Get me the hell out of here, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and so, you know, but 
we, I just try to keep her calm and, you know, I, I, as far as support, you know, my, any time that I needed answers, if I had questions and needed answers or needed to understand something better or changes of medication, you know, she was there. She, she was available and able to take care of that. And now she's my doctor because <laughs> I liked her so much. <laughs> <laughs> yes? Did you just have a primary doctor or did you go with more of a geriatric memory specialist? Um, um, I had the, a primary doctor, but she specialized in geriatrics. Okay. Yeah. Just another quick question. Mm -hmm. Do you um, seek any resources or organizations that you felt were helpful for you through the journey with your mom? Um, we, I called a place for mom. And, um, but I don't think anything ever came of that. I think that at that time, a lot of the facilities were pretty full. And, and, and either that or the, some they just didn't recommend, you know, for where she was at, you know, like she was, she was, not, she was still early stage when we moved her here. So, you know, you don't want to put her in with, people that are really worse off and and not you know that she wouldn't you know to be with to, it's when the, if they can't um, you know if you can't socialize with with the people because they're just out of it you know then it's not a good situation so but it, we try they try we tried to get her in with, you know, residents that are in a similar situation. What support did you find for you? I didn't get a lot of support. <laughs> My brother and sister were, you know, many states away and, and they really didn't help in any way. <laughs> they just left I volunteered to to take take that on and and they let me <laughs> so I really didn't get any support you know from them any family support but did you go to any support groups at all while you were dealing with this mm, I know they're around yeah this was this was a long time ago though you know when yeah. um, when my mom when I went through the journey with her because this was 2005 when she was diagnosed and 2006 is when we found out and I don't know I probably just wasn't even aware you know I, I had a, a family three boys and I was, I was pretty busy <laughs> and so I, I yeah so you know I, I guess I just didn't even think of of myself I just you know more, you know, taking care of mom, taking care of my family. Hi. <laughs> no, that's okay. <laughs> Should we start over? <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> easy, easy enough. <laughs> so, yes. Um, no. No, she she needed care for grooming. She she lost that right away. You know, even though she was early stage, you know, she she didn't see the importance anymore. She didn't care. She didn't want to. You know, it, it just her whole mindset changed. And it's probably not that she couldn't. She just didn't want to. Did they help her with that? Yes, they did. And um, and then it came to where the, she wouldn't cooperate anymore, and and so then they do sponge baths at night when she was in bed, <laughs> hoping you know that she'd be sleeping most of the time. And but it didn't always go well for them, you know, either. So, but I I think I think where she was at for the most of the time, I think the care staff was just tired of, you know, because she would yell at them, 
she'd say, you know, get away from me, don't touch me, and, you know, she'd yell at them, and, and it was just very difficult for them because she was difficult, but then again, you know, she was being difficult because she didn't want them doing what they were doing, and, you know, because even just a sponge bath, you know, she, she just couldn't tolerate, it, couldn't tolerate it. Yeah. Because I remember when my father in law, you know, if they would approach him, like you say, he's like, No, I don't want to do it. Mm -hmm. But if they approached him in the right way, right. then he would be sure, you know, let's go do this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's, you know. So they need to know how to. Yeah, and when I visited, even when she didn't know me, she thought that I, she, I was there so often, she thought that I was actually one of the care staff. Mm -hmm. And, you know, she'd say, I'm hungry, get me something to eat, you know. <laughs> I said, okay, you know, and I'd go get her a yogurt, you know, she took her free yogurt or something. And, you know, and I didn't mind doing that because, you know, it's one less thing that they have to do. And so it just, I forgot what your question was, or if well, statement. Was, was yeah, yeah. 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 Well, yeah, and I was saying too that you know the the facility that she was at for the longest amount of time, you know they just they knew she was hard of hearing and they'd stick their face right in front of hers and then they'd shout at her and and that's what she couldn't handle. I mean. But where when she went to act an actual memory care facility, it it was a world of difference. I mean, you know, they, they would explain everything they did. They'd tell her beforehand, okay, we're going to do this. Um, the facility she was at didn't have any, um, like, activities anymore. The activity director, I, I think she became ill, and so they just didn't have anyone anymore. So there were no activities, nothing to keep them occupied or engaged. And um, when we moved her to memory care, the, um, the activity lady was really wonderful. I mean, they'd be in a big circle around a table and, and they would, she'd read the newspaper to them, even if they didn't understand. You know, they were listening, they were quiet, they were paying attention. And they'd ask questions sometimes, and and you know it kept them engaged, and that's and that's what they need when you have dementia is it to use your brain a little bit, you know, just don't let it stop working, just try keep to keep it working. Yes. So, Kara, yes. <laughs> we have a couple questions from those joining. Oh, us okay, online. okay, perfect. Um, how did you manage caring for your mother and also for your young boys at the same time? <laughs> Well, <laughs> the, the boys eventually got in school, <laughs> so then I had a lot more time, but um, it's just, I was young, <laughs> you know, I just started having my kids at 25, and, and I guess I just had a lot of energy back then. <laughs> caring for their own children? Well, <laughs> um, I'll have to think about that one because, you know, it, my kids were really easy. I mean, they were not kids that got into trouble. They weren't into sports. I wasn't driving them all over from one sport to another. You know, they were academic more so than you know, <laughs> than sport enthusiasts. So, I mean, I, I really felt that I lucked out by having kids that, you know, they did their homework, they, they, they were pretty good kids. But, and I was able to spend a lot of time with my mom, but they were a little bit older um, by the time she had dementia, so. 
they were old enough that you know if they needed a snack they could make a snack if they wanted to make something a meal they they were able to make like sloppy joes or something and um, so I was able to concentrate on on the um, my mom more you know more easily oh yeah um, was the memory care place is that something that's um, more specialized as far as like uh, you know, being more expensive where you have to make a decision like okay I, I want to have my parent be somewhere where you know she can get the activities and the different things you talked about mm -hmm. so It really wasn't. Um, when we went to the semi-assisted, I thought it was going to be a lot more when we went to full assisted living. And it was really pretty much, not really much more. And when we went to memory care, I thought, again, this was going to cost a fortune. And it was the same as what the assisted living was. So I was getting so much better care at the memory care than at assisted living. Did you see, like, um, were there, uh, like with the assisted living, were there differences in places as far as, you know, did you visit places and compare them and was there diff cost differences and things like that? Yeah, or? yeah. We, we went to several. Um, you know, we tried Stoughton, you know, we went out to a couple places in Stoughton and um, we went to the two in Oregon. Well, there's more here, there's more now than what it used to be. But we went to the two in Oregon and um, the one that had, at the time, they assured me that they could do dementia and um, they had activities, but like I said, then the activity director became ill and then there were no more activities. So, and that happened fairly early on when, well, you know, when my mom first got there. So she didn't really get much inactivities, but the memory care, they, they really knew how to, to deal with dementia. And I mean, the activity lady, she was able to um, polish my mom's fingernails where at the other assisted living, they, she'd say, don't touch me, don't touch me, don't hurt me, don't hurt me. <laughs> and, and it was just, you know, it was a night and day difference. You know, the, she, the lady that did the, her nails, um, she, she told me that she was her sister, that my, my mom was, the lady that did her nails was my mom's sister. And she was a black lady, <laughs> and she, you know. So she a little bit, you know, confused. But you know, it was, she just, she just. Oh, sorry, I'm sorry. She just, she just liked the lady so much, and I think she could do anything, you know, that she wanted as far as, you know, any kind of activity. She would try it and do it. But that that was how how, I guess, safe she might have felt you know, being there. Right. My dad was in a nursing home sort of during the peak of COVID and he also had some behavioral issues. And so we, I, I felt like he was in a nursing home that was kind of the, I don't know, the, the lowest quality, the cheapest, like probably one of the worst places he could be. Yeah. So I always wondered, you know, if things have been different, you know, with COVID or his behavioral issues, like are there other options out there that, you know, maybe you have to pay more <coughs> Yeah, well, I know, um, you know, if your parent or whoever, you know, needs care, if they're on Medicaid, those are, are not the, known as being the best quality care, <laughs> so. So if you can private pay a little yeah. more at a, yeah. a nicer well, my mom, my mom was lucky that, you know, my, my dad had a good income for many, many years and, and, you know, they kind of pinched pennies and, and so she, you know, had enough 
money to take care of her for quite a while. And, but as it is, as it turned out, you know, she only was there for four years in assisted care. I thought, you know, when her heart was good, her blood pressure was always good, you know, she was healthy otherwise, except for the brain. <laughs> And I expected her to live like 10 years, you know, after we moved her down here. And, but it was just, you know, four years, it just really eats it away very fast. Did you have anyone else that, online? No other questions online. <laughs> I have a general question to anyone in here. <laughs> Hmm. No. Nope. My husband and I actually looked into it and we, we talked with an agent and went through the calculations and it, it, it truly is like you're kind of almost going to just pay the same whether you get the insurance or not is kind of what we, what we found because you're really, you know, they're setting up your premiums and they're setting up your, you know, everything with it to cover what you using the long-term care policy is that um, the, well, first of all, my parents aren't willing to go, and so that's one obstacle, but, mm -hmm. but, this, but, the, but even, so they're not willing to go to a place where we can even use the long-term care, right? So, mm -hmm. so that's one thing, you can only use, it, like, they wanna be in their home, um, which is fine, so we'll find in-home care, but the in-home care places in town, or Dane County, don't have people right now because there's not enough CNAs. So then you have to go private to find people, and um, that's where we're at now. So they've had this really great long-term care policy that we can't use yeah. because the place where they wanna be, we can't find people to care for them in the way that they that I want them to be cared for, right? Mm -hmm. Which is just basic stuff. I'm not a high maintenance person. Mm -hmm. So anyway, that's that's the problem that's we're running right into okay. is we can't even well, use the policy that they have. Huh. Mm -hmm. too, are not a waiting. It right. doesn't kick in until ninety days later. Right. Uh, you know, you're yes. Yes. You have to pay the upfront. Yeah. Right. You do that. Yeah. Another thing to consider is um, Medicare doesn't pay anything with dementia. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, what my doc, her doctor ordered home care after her stroke. And, um, you know, because she was still, she was very weak yet and not getting around real well. And, and she needed help doing her, you know, checking her blood glucose. And the Medicare refused it because she had dementia, but it didn't have anything to do with the dementia. It had to do with having a stroke, but they still refused it. All right. Um, well, that takes us to the end of our presentation tonight. Um, for folks here, if you want to stick around and chat with the author and um, get books, you can do that. Um, to our folks at home, thank you for joining us. I hope you enjoyed this presentation. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll say that my grandmother